Shows have been great. And I like the glasses. The glasses work good. I remember you were a little self-conscious when I was on TV. I still am. You know, it's but you know, I think it gives, I think it gives you real gravitas. It works. No, it looks good. It looks really? good. I would tell you if it didn't. I said that to my wife. Hmm. I said, she said, I like it too. It does, because it looks like. No, I've, I've heard, uh, <clears throat> I've heard that many times that people like the glasses. I oh, just oh, this is, is this. Is this I just water? can't. That's just water. Mm. I just can't get past the fact that the glasses represent to me a milestone of aging. It you know it's like there are milestones of aging. You were telling me about the pickle jar last time I saw you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, it's that kind of thing. You know. Yeah. yeah. You you can't apparently open pickle jars anymore. Well, it takes a little more strength, but <laughs> but I think it, but you get to do the you get to do but, the Walter Cronkite. You know what I'm saying? I, yeah, I, give me. I'll show you. My, give me glasses. Okay. Do the. <laughs> oh, I thought. Remember how he would do that? Yes, but I. President Kennedy died today. No, I was going to do it. I, oh. I it, it's it's I can do it exactly. Oh, go ahead. You're you fucking it. it up. And. There it is, the flash from Dallas. Yeah, yeah that's great. President Kennedy died at that's great. 105 p.m. Yeah. 145, I think. Whatever right. it was. But, I mean, there was a guy who you could see on the air that it was the genuineness of being choked up. Right. But unlike what they would be probably doing today, didn't let himself, you know, he had the self-restraint, right. the people right. of that era... I'm the newsman. I'm here to do a job. Yes, it's devastating news. I may swallow a couple of times, but then I go on and I do it. I don't blubber. Yeah. Right, Jay? Exactly. Where's is, the camera? Where's your camera? Right here? Uh, the, yeah. There's, oh, yeah. There's, they're all over. What, this is like a, a reality show. Have we started already? I'm lost. Yeah. Oh. Right? Yeah. Oh, I have. <laughs> okay. Well, let's go. What are you doing? We're doing it. Okay. This is the show. <laughs> what, oh. do you, what do you expect oh, me right. to do? I don't know. I get I'll... drinking high with somebody I like. Okay, That's okay. It. there you go. I don't right. have a series of questions or anything. Uh, all right. Um, <laughs> I mean, Jay, tell me something about your background. I understand you claim to be a comedian. You, Leno, did I tell you that claim story? That is, what. Well, tell that story. I love that story. No, I was in Dayton, Ohio. I had just thought I was guest hosting The Tonight Show. I was, you know, doing the comedy club. So um, Guest hosting already? No, in 86. I thought this was way before that. The claim, he claims to be a comedian? No, no, not claims to be a comedian. What it was was, it was about, I had been hosting The Tonight Show for a number of weeks. So I'm doing some clubs in Ohio. So they go, oh, you're on Dayton. You're on at uh, the new news, for a female anchor. What's her name? Okay. Sorry, I'm Jay Leno. He's a, she says, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar. I said, oh, my name's Jay Leno. I'm a comedian. I'm playing, you know, chuckles or giggles, whatever it is. And um, and I guest host the Tonight Show. I talk with Jay Leno, Leno, who claims to have hosted the Tonight Show. I go, you know, I, I can prove it. <laughs> I, I said, you have film right here in this. This is an NBC <laughs> affiliate. I'm sure there's tape. You know. Now, either you told me a different story. No, that I told you that story. It's so interesting because I will admit to the fact that the brain over time sometimes does. You know, the one you might confuse it with is Buffalo. Buffalo, my mom. Uh, do you remember John Eric Hexham? Yes. Remember the kid who sadly killed himself? Sadly. He had a... Well, tell people why. He thought the gun was... Right. He No. It, he, it was a blank. It was a blank and that shoot. It would shoot a paper wad. But since he had it right against his forehead, he, instead of just going... The pressure right. went, what, went into his brain and well, killed him. The lesson, kids, is don't fire even a blank gun into your head. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> and anyway, <laughs> the guests on the show were him. He was the star because of uh, he had some show where he played a spy coming. What out. show? What, what guest on what show? Uh, A.M. Buffalo. A.M. Buffalo. A.M. Buffalo. It was him. Oh God. Me and seven authentic African pygmy dancers. <laughs> All right, so I'm sitting. I'm sitting in the green room like here. And John Eric Hetson is being interviewed. And the seven pygmies are sitting right here next to me. <laughs> and they have spears. And they have their full, the seven of them sitting there. Jay, you said authentic. I yeah, would authentic. assume okay. they have spears. Okay. You know, so they're all sitting there and we're all watching the show. And, you know, the, and the talent coordinator comes and goes, 
Mr. Leno, Mr. Leno. I go, I'm Leno. Oh, you're Leno. Okay, you're up next. And I went, and I just thought, oh, okay. Oh, that's a scream. Yeah, it's just so stupid. Oh, my God. Mr. Leno. <laughs> Over here. Over here. Yeah. But I swear to God, I thought you told a story about being a young, very young comedian who'd done The Tonight Show maybe once or twice. No, no. And you were working some club or somewhere, maybe it was not a club, it's one of those like private events where it's a business guy introducing you. You know, you've done many of those. I certainly did it back in well, the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, we... Like, no, this was, no, this was, that was the, that was... Uh... Okay, so tell me if this is in any way familiar. Go ahead. And again, these are like corporate events. Larry right. Miller has a famous right, story right. about um, he goes up after the guy does a long, they, you know, someone in the company died. And so oh, right. it was like, oh, we all remember Frank. He was just such a great guy. We loved him very much. And he died tragically of cancer after a long illness two weeks ago. And now a funny young man. Larry, right. you know, so they don't know how to do show business. No, no. What you're so, thinking of is freshen. I'll tell you what it was. I was a comic in New York. So this guy comes to see me, he goes, I, I'm, I'm bringing some buyers in for a product. I've, I've invented a new product with their people. We want you to pretend to be the spokesman. I said, what's the product? It's called Freshen. I said, what is it? He said, it's a moist toilet paper used after going to the bathroom <laughs> to do, and it said on the side, to do away with embarrassing rectal odor. I said, okay. So I go, and what do you want me to do? Okay, okay you go on. I'll introduce you as my vice president of sales, and you do some jokes. Okay. Really? So anyway, so this guy invites all these Liggett Rexall dealers <laughs> you know, and, and, and they're all sitting there like this. There's about 25 of them, you know. The guy goes, I've got this product. It's going to be a big hit. Uh, it's got adhesive. We put it on the wall next to, it sticks to the wall right above or below the toilet paper. And it's after you use the toilet paper, you use this to avoid embarrassing rectal odor. And they're all sitting like this. They're all doing this. <laughs> yeah, you look at their watches, you know. Like they've heard this pitch before. Well, they just, they're obviously not interested in the process. You know? <laughs> so this guy, but let me introduce, he can see he's, he's starting to get flop sweat. Let me introduce my vice president of sales, Jay Leno. All right, so I got up there and I started doing my act and they're all going, <laughs> you know, and so I do about 10 or 15 minutes to nothing, you know, and he goes, and then he goes back. He goes, that, of course, was not my vice president of sales, but Jane Leno, a professional comedian. And see them all go, professional comedian. He I mean, was just, just like the most horrible. So then they all leave, right? And the guy says, listen, I want you to buy this product. So nobody, nobody buys the product, right? And he says, he says look, look. Look, I'll be level with you. I got a warehouse in, in Teaneck down here. I, I got like 500,000 500, rolls of this stuff. Okay, take some to your stores. Just try it. No, not interested. Just take it with you. Just take it with you. You know? So I'm, I'm waiting now to get paid, right? So now people are leaving. Tears are streaming down the guy's face. Just try it. Just, I'm telling you, try it. So he goes, what do you want? I said, can, can I get paid? Yeah, I get paid. So I took like, 10 rolls of fresh and that was that was my pay that was that was a horrible one maybe that's okay that's still no okay i'm telling you what the story is yeah what, what? it was it's very basic that you were doing one of these corporate gigs where they often uh, i've had been introduced where they don't even understand to say your name at the end of the introduction right. so it's like bill maher is a funny guy who's done three tonight shows here he is. Or, no, they don't even say, you know, they'll just end the set. It's just like people have no cue to clap. Yeah. They don't go, here's right. Bill Maher. So uh, this one, you're doing this, some corporate gig, and the guy is like, he probably had it on a card, was reading your credits. And he's like, uh, uh, and we have a comedian on, uh, Jay Leno. Uh, no, I'm fucking this story up. He, the, the, what, he, what the guy embarrassed you by doing, he said, he, <laughs> Jay Leno... He claims to be a comedian. Yeah. Well, no, claims to have done The Tonight Show. That's yeah. what it was. Well, the one, he claims to have, that never happened. No, the, the, the one that happened was one who claims to have hosted. That, that, that's where it came from. I think you get a couple of stories. Maybe. You know, it's, it's 40 years ago. Club cigarettes. It's, it's 40, it's 40 but years ago. The fact that you uh, would, were working, we're doing AM Buffalo. 
I think says so much about you, Jay, and your work ethic, because well, like, you, know you would never catch me doing AM anything, let alone Buffalo, but, I bet, in February. But, but, but you got to remember, back in the day, those were the local shows that brought a local audience. I, I mean, know. Remember the, remember the PM magazine shows? They always used to have those at 7.30. Those are pretty big, too. Uh, and, you know, the funny thing about it is people come up to you like 10 years later and go, are you from... Uh, are you from Montana? No. Well, I saw you on, uh, you know, Hello Butte or whatever the name of the show. I go, no. Oh, you're not from there. No, no, I was just on the show doing it. Oh. <laughs> yeah, 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 I did all, I did every really? local. Oh, yeah, hilarious. But you, I know when you hosted The Tonight Show that you would be like, you'd get at the office at like 8 a.m., right? Oh, easy, yeah, yeah. 8 a.m. Yeah, 7.30, 8 a.m. A comedian in an office at eight a.m. Yeah, but you know, something? and you'd be calling affiliates. And, yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, that you're following Johnny Carson. Okay, you get the network's getting letters like you know, they should just make that uh, sixty minutes of dead air in honor of Johnny. You know, <laughs> it's not fair to put somebody else. In. I mean, that's that's the kind of stuff that you're dealing. Really? With. Oh yeah, just crazy stuff. Yeah, yeah. What do you mean? Because they were so up Johnny's ass that. They couldn't accept that the next... Oh, yeah, of course, of course. Really? Yeah. I remember I wrote a uh, thing for Time magazine when Johnny died. They right. asked me to do a thing. And I said at the end of it, I said, you know, he was amazing for his time, but times change. And Leno was right for this time. And I don't, I don't know if they, they printed it, but I don't know if they liked it. because I mean, it was very... Well, you know what's fascinating is... is Somebody at NBC gave me Johnny's reviews when he took over from Parr. And I was stunned at how vicious they were. Because Parr was the erudite guy he would have yeah. on, uh, you know. Right. Uh, you know, and Johnny was sort of Aunt Blabby and all that kind of stuff. And obviously had a wider appeal than Parr. But, but they thought it was, oh, the dumbing down of television and all this kind of comedy and all that kind of stuff. But, you know? but television is always perpetually getting dumbed down because right. the population gets dumber. Right. There was a reason why erudite Jack Parr right. could survive in 1959. Noel Coward had a talk show in the 50s. Is that right? Yeah. In America? Like 90 minutes. Uh, let's discuss the, the right. Hamlet, of course, certainly the, the third act. When they, yeah, yeah. Well, Johnny used to do an hour and a half yeah and the last half hour was like authors like he would have a serious intellectual discussion yeah. with astronomers and authors and people like that okay but that's what my point was in that article like times change jay had his finger on the pulse of where america was in his era johnny if he had been doing that same show he was doing would not have survived in 2008 or something well he, you never know but you never well know. well if he was doing the same kind of thing, it was broad, but it, you know, your show was more of like a party and that's what people wanted. It wasn't so, the accent wasn't that much on just people talking. It was, and then it even moved after you to like just throwing water in people's faces. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's just true. I mean, people, you, the, the you know, artist the, has to follow where the, the toughest where thing the, about, about, where the, yeah. The toughest, thing, the toughest thing about late night now is that the commercials, you know, you, you get used to streaming and watching Netflix. And, and I said, well, let me see what the guys are doing. And I go, another commercial? I mean, there's a nine minute break at 12 o'clock to 12.09 on almost all the, after 11 o'clock at night, you can add more commercials. So, so they just come back for like a minute. They come back for a minute and you go, geez, I mean, you can't watch. And 30 second spots are so well produced now and they have so much content. They seem like a minute spot, you know, and you go, how many commercials? 30 second there? spot of ads? Or yeah, ads, from, you know, whatever it is. Okay. You know, yeah. Well, I remember when I was following Nightline, I had a six minute gap. Right. Like three minutes of our commercials at the end. We were daring the audience to go away. <laughs> Especially at midnight. I know, I know. You're daring them. I know, I know. I feel, well, let's go to bed quick. You know? Now they do a hot switch, don't they? Haven't they done that forever? What do you where, mean a hot switch? A hot switch where you go from one show to the other. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then the commercial comes, yeah. Yeah, so that you catch the people and get them hooked right. or whatever. I mean, I don't, I don't know how in an age of 
streaming and, you know, VCRs, DVRs, that anybody could, why would you watch something in real time when you could skip the commercials? Right. And yet they must still do it. People must still be in bed watching between their toes because those shows are still on. Yeah. I mean, they're Jimmy and Jimmy are talented guys. They're all talented. You know how many people I have, guys will send me, you know, usually older guys, they have some car they want to sell me or something. I said, email me some pictures. I'm not going to go through that trouble. I'll go down, I'll put a stamp, I'll go down to the post office, buy a stamp, stand in line, put it in a slot. I said, that's really not easier than just going, bink, you know. But no, they don't, they don't get it. Well, my friend Jim Bowley has the greatest line about, you know, he's a sitcom writer. Right? I know Jim. You know Jimmy, okay. So he said when, like he was on Golden Girls, he said, TV guy used to come out and you'd look at the fall preview issue, what their lineup of different shows for different networks, and you see the two or three shows you were up against. Now you're up against everything that was ever made. Right, yeah, it's true. And yeah. that's the truth. Yeah, I You were th- up against everything that was ever made. Think like about a- this, TV Guide was the biggest selling magazine in the world. Really? In the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. Yeah, the biggest selling magazine in the world. Now it's barely a pamphlet, you know. I didn't know it still exists. Oh, it, it still exists. It, it's, it's like a magazine. It's, you know, it's like this thick. I mean, that's, that was always... I have every fall preview issue from, like, the late 60s to the mid-80s. I remember we did a, a... It was very important to me. A TV guide on world events as written by TV guide and jeers to Hitler, you know, it was that kind of stuff, <laughs> you know. You did that on the Tonight Show? Yeah, yeah, and um, jeers to Hitler for invading Poland. So, so wait, you, you, did you say you shot seven shows today? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we shoot seven a day for but that's 10 weeks, 12 For weeks. 10 weeks. 10 or 12 weeks, yeah. Right. It seems like every time I turn my TV on, that show is on. Your I don't show. know. It's different times. I don't know. It's it's a different time. I mean, different head? markets and different times. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's syndicated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's old school. Boom. Right. But you must love it. I mean, you look like you're having a ball doing. I like it. It's easy enough you to like, do. I don't, you yeah. know what? You do the time. Actually, I got to see the movie. I got to read the book. Right. I got to listen to the album. Right. That I just show up. What's this guy do? He's like, boom. And you talk. It's like doing jaywalking on the street. Jaywalking. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, same thing. Same you know, thing. I brought that up recently. I did an editorial on our show about how dumb people were. Oh, yeah, I saw it. that. Yeah, you saw, was, I watched that. There's yeah, a TikTok that. guy who just ripped you off. That made me laugh. Did yeah. that whole thing. Well, I mean, that's the most, everybody accused right. everybody of ripping stuff off. It's the most common a Kimmel does it on his show. It's not a rip off of me. Right. I I, I didn't well, rip off Steve Allen. Steve Allen didn't rip off the guy on the radio. Arthur Godfrey. I don't know who it was. Yeah, that's one. No, of but the you were the first one to. No, sorry. Your jaywalking thing was specifically aimed at showing how stupid people were. Well, yeah. These people, the the other guys, they did talk to people on right. the street, and people could sometimes get caught in the act of being themselves. Right. Right. But. Yours was specifically, this person doesn't know who Lincoln is. <laughs> right, yeah. you know? It was always amazing and, to me. And, and that's what was funny about it, was and sad at yeah. the same time. Oh, yeah, yeah. But I don't think any, no, I think you started that jaywalking, or else you wouldn't have done it. It was an, That was an original. Yeah, it story. was a lot of fun. That was my favorite thing to do. And yeah. that's sort of what this show is. It's sort of the same thing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Jay, I love it that you're not like, you have no like ego about like you climbed the mountain, you got to the top for a very long time. I've said many times you got fired twice for the crime. Nobody of being- cares if you climb the mountain. You talk about climbing mountain. I'll tell you a climbing mountain story. I had this guy on the. <laughs> I have this guy in the Tonight Show. You never let me ask let, one let, question. Let me finish this. <laughs> His guy is blind, and he climbed Mount Everest. The most amazing, he's an athlete, he's blind. Who hasn't? Two months, he's climbing Mount Everest. He's on the, holding on, he doesn't know if it's daytime or night. It's rains and people don't go. Oh, boo So he's on, he's on my show and I, see, and I said during the break, do you do a lot of motivational speaking? He's all pissed off. I go, I go, why? He goes, every motivational speaker, I, I talk about 
climbing Mount Everest and how hot it was and it rained and snow. So you don't know it's day or night. You don't know where you are on the mountain. You don't know how far. You know, I, I've got to feel my way to the top. It took me two months, you know. And he says, inevitably afterwards, when he does the meet and greet, somebody goes, you know, I was going to climb Everest last year, but my <laughs> kid's got soccer and the wife, uh, wife wants to go to her mother-in-law. And he's like, and he's like blind. He's like, I, I just want to, I just want to stab these people. He's so furious. He's, oh, hilarious. Hilarious. We are supported by Wine Enthusiast. It's summertime. The days are hot and the grill is fired up. It's the perfect time for enjoying wine with friends. And if you have family around, you're going to need that wine. Wine Enthusiast designs and offers the largest selection of wine coolers for every drinker, every budget and every size collection, from six to 600 bottles. Plus, expert wine storage consultants are available by phone to help you find the right fit for all your needs. Wine Enthusiast is the premier destination for the wine lifestyle, offering an incredible selection of unique wine accessories, glassware, furniture, wine storage, gifts, and more. I love Wine Enthusiast. They sent some fantastic custom club random glassware for me and my guests to use. Appreciate it. Nobody has even dropped one yet. Visit WineEnthusiast.com or text the code RANDOM to 511511 to check out all of Wine Enthusiast's summer savings. Text RANDOM to 511511. Text RANDOM to 511511 today. Certain exclusions may apply. You may receive up to one additional text. Text FEES may apply. Text STOP to opt out. We are supported by SignalWire. Remember all of those classic sci-fi shows like The Jetsons and Star Trek? They presented a picture of the future, where technology would make new ways of communicating possible, like Captain Kirk facing off with Khan from the bridge of the Enterprise. Well, it's 2022. The future is here. But our current tech is a pretty far cry from what real-time communications could be. That's where SignalWire comes in. SignalWire is an advanced cloud platform for building next-gen communication experiences. Tired of Zoom? So is literally everybody. Maybe it's me, but should something that slow really be called Zoom? With SignalWire, you can create your own video communication product with far better audio and video quality that actually uses less bandwidth and doesn't slow down your users' devices. And with SignalWire, you can completely customize the user experience and integrate it within an existing application or website with ease. Most importantly, you don't have to be Spock to figure it out. Whether you're a developer, product builder, or just someone with a cool idea, SignalWire offers APIs, SDKs, and even copy and paste code snippets to help make your vision a reality. Fast. Visit SignalWire.com random to sign up for a free account and get an additional 5,000 video minutes for testing. Go to SignalWire.com random and build what's next in real-time communications. Go to signalwire.com slash random. You got fired twice for the crime of being number one. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you just have no bitterness. About I ever tell you what they said to me? I said, I'm number one. You know what they said? <laughs> Jay. We want what's above number one. No. Yes. Yes. That's my favorite quote. No. And I went, come on. What's above number one? <laughs> I said, we're number one. We're winning in every demographic group. I know, but we want what's above that. That yeah. is priceless show business stupidity. Yeah, that's wonderful. It's, it's, well, I mean, how can you not have fun with well, it? Well, you know, I, I believe uh, to someone who was sitting in that chair at some podcast we did here, I think I was talking about this because the subject of agenting came up. And I was saying, to me, the argument the strongest argument for why you need someone speaking for you is because nbc had ari emanuel right. a dear friend of mine right and a genius agent right and, you know now one of the biggest moguls in the world he had nbc had him in their ear convincing them i mean that is a genius salesman right. who can convince a network to look for what was the phrase we want what's above number one. Right. right. That's, and you did not have an agent. Right? No, I didn't, have, I didn't have an agent or a manager. Right. And do you have regrets about that? No. I don't have any at all. Because everything I do, I spoke for myself. 
There's one thing about but maybe you needed that little snake in their ear to say. You know, you know something you don't. You don't need the snake in but, the ear. But the snake worked. Huh? It got it got it got them to again. And how did it work in the who won in the end? Well, they canned your ass, so you didn't. You should still be there. You you well, are I, I wouldn't still be there now. Why? At some point because Why? at some point I shouldn't have to know all of Jay Z's music, you know. I mean, it gets to the point where, you know, when you're 40 and you're talking to a 26-year-old supermodel, it's sexy. When you're in your 60s, you're the creepy old guy. You, All right, know? you know what? That's such ridiculous thinking. Just don't be creepy when you talk to them. Well, you can talk to any person of any age. That's a ridiculous well, restriction well, well, to that, put on. Well, that is true. But I, it is I, true. But I just say you that. You can't because, talk to a 26-year-old uh, without leering? Well, uh, that's not, not leering. And you were just, never a leerer anyway. You're, you're famously happily married. Right. And a devoted faithful husband you do not have to worry that if if they come out in a short skirt that's because they're they're selling a movie and that would get well people... my thing is i wouldn't change anything because it all worked out fine yes but... but at least i i rose and fell by my own hand as opposed to other people moving things around you know i remember one time i was on stage well you didn't fall you never fell they felled you again for the crime of being number one, and I think if you could have had someone whispering in their ear, this is a very stupid thing to do. It's called a cash cow. Just right. milk that for as long but as But you know, can. you find in show business, you die from a thousand paper cuts. What does that mean? What that means is when they decide you want you, they want you out, suddenly things start appearing in the trades that you're difficult. Really? Uh, th yes, I've that seen, happened. I, I've not to, no, not to me, but I, I, I would see it happen to other people. You know, things would just get like who? Uh, like what? Like give me an example. Like what did they say? Well, it did happen to me in the sense that once, I, I did a, oh, I did this movie. Tina did this movie a long time ago, and Tell I had it, my contract that I had these certain dates that I couldn't do because I was committed to. Performing. Were you the detective, that movie? Was yeah, yeah, that stupid movie, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what okay. is it called? I don't even remember. Oh, you do. Called. Come on. But, but anyway. I've seen and it. And then they said, no, we got to shoot in those days. No, I already made this commit. And then suddenly I started seeing things in the paper. I'm difficult. My hairdresser was arguing. I don't have a hairdresser. And I would just see all these things. <laughs> and I go, okay, this is how it works. They just plant these little stories and little things happen. When you, when you control your own fate... It's fine. And plus, the nice thing was, you know, I'll tell you a story. When I was doing The Tonight Show, um, I got a call from, well, how can I say this? this uh, there, were, there was a group of people, a whole bunch of comedians were, hosting, were, were um, guest hosting The Tonight Show. And they're all handled by the same guy. And this guy called me and said, we want to handle you too and put you in the roster because we're asking $25,000 a night to guest host. And I said, oh, that's, that's okay. He said, what are you getting to guest host? I said, I'm getting $512 a night to guest host. Because that, that was scale. scale. Yeah. I said, okay. He said, right there. He said, sign with us. And then when you comes around, I said, you know, I'm gonna keep my 512 a night. Okay. And then I told Johnny's people, I'll do it for 512. And then they look at the ratings and they go, you know, Lionel's getting just as good of ratings as Johnny owns the company. You can save about, you know, about forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a month by having him. And then I became the permanent guest host. And I never discussed money. I said, the money will and come later on. And it worked out fine because I got it under the, because I liked it, okay. And then, Oh, and then they came to me with offers for money. I said, oh, okay, that's fine. And I never had to argue. Well, see, to me, Jay, that is the quintessential story summing you up. Because when people ask me about you, I always say, and of course, you do have your detractors. I mean, I don't, I, I don't quite understand them. Because I always say, like, Leno's such an interesting guy. Because like, as a human being, you, you could never do better than asking, what would Jay do? You know, he's a very moral guy. But he's also fucking Italian. Right. And right. boy, when he wants to fucking hide in the closet and outsmart you, he well, will do I did that, that because and do, he will always fucking find the way to get to the top of that mountain. I had a hunch that that um, 
that uh, Jack Welch was on my side. He was the head of NBC, of GE. He owned GE. Which yeah. owned NBC. Yeah, so when, I, when, when they were having that meeting and I was listening in, I heard him say, why don't we go with Leno? He seems funny. He seems to work good. He seems to be a hard worker. <laughs> I like him. I went, thank you. Now, where, I, now where did you hear that? In uh, the, in, oh, when I was in the closet. I loved it. Jack, Jack was I in love that. Jack was in the meeting. But yeah. in the closet, that's like only you and R. Kelly could get away with an in the closet. Well, that's right. Me and R. Kelly. Thank you very much. For well, that. he does have a hole. In the closet. No, it's not in the closet. I was just listening. No, I, I know. Just, just listening. Yeah. I wanted but, to know what was going yeah. on. And the funny thing was about it. Here's a funny thing. I did it twice. And the twice. second I never knew that. Yeah. And the second time, I heard Warren Littlefield say, you know, somehow I think Leno knows what goes on in this room. He says, from now on, we didn't even speak to we didn't even tell our second <laughs> lieutenant. <laughs> He says, he says I, we didn't tell our second lieutenant what goes on in this room. So later that day, I'm walking the hall, and I see, I walk by Warren. I go, second lieutenant Jay Leno, how are you? And he goes, what the fuck does that mean? What's that mean? I go, no, I'm, I'm just making a joke. Why did you say second lieutenant? I, I just said second lieutenant. Oh, my what? God. Oh, 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 yeah, it was very funny. It was very funny. And then another time. Wait, wait, so what a mind fuck on him. Well, what did he, well, I'll did tell he the ever... second time. The second time, he was in Florida in a meeting. So I kept trying to reach him. So I said, give me his room. So they, they ring his room. It doesn't answer. And I go, oh, he was just downstairs. I bet, I bet he was in the bathroom when the phone rang. So I called back again. He goes, hey, hey it's Jay. He says, where are you in California? I said, you were just in the bathroom. So about it. He goes, how'd, how'd you know that? How'd you know that? <laughs> and he had the room swept. And that made me laugh afterwards. You know what that, that is so fucking. It's very funny. You know what that reminds me of? What? Did you ever see the Jason Bourne movies? Yes, I love the Jason Bourne movies. Okay, so at the end of, I think it's the second one, or what he's talking to Pam Landy, the, the head of the, uh, the head of the CIA, but right. the CIA was played by uh, Joan Allen, amazing. Right, that's, I, suppo I that's supposed one. to be um, Gina, the head Davis? of the CIA. No, Gina, the head of the CIA. Gina. She wasn't the head of the CIA. Pam Landy was, uh, she winds up being the good guy in right, the CIA. Right. Yeah, but in the real life, Gina has, is it Haskell? Haspel. Haspel. Oh, yeah, okay. She, yeah, she's head oh, of right. the CIA. Oh, right. She was head of the CIA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, you know, at the end of the one of the, uh, the first or the second one, he's talking to her and she's like, oh, I got him on the phone finally. It's like, oh, my born, why don't you come in? He's like, no, I don't think I'm going to do that right now. And uh, Pam, she gets some rest. You look tired. Oh, I remember the scene. Because he was across. Right. And then she's like, what the fuck? Jason Bourne, you are a badass. Well, I'll tell you a story. Dun, 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 that great Moby Gina scene. Haskell told me one time that. How do you know her? I, I, I know her a little. We had dinner. The okay. CIA person? Yeah, yeah, Gina Haskell. Why you? I don't know why me. Why me? I don't know. What I did a lot of people. I did a Gorbachev. Dinner with Netanyahu, a lot of people. You know, when Excuse you're on the me. Tonight Show, they call you. Gorbachev called me when he was in, he said he wanted to have dinner. All right, so I, I, I said to Mavis, Gorbachev and Rachel want to have dinner, you know, and he doesn't speak English. No. No. So we have, and of course, I make the big mistake. So I was introducing, I, it's my, and the brother bra the Rachel, Rachel and I to me, she said, <laughs> oh, you obviously married an older man. <laughs> And, it, and you see, blah, 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 blah. And, and she gets this look. Blah, blah, blah. My husband is not elderly. Uh, no, 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 not. I was saying, I said, I, then I, again, I said, no, no, I mean, obviously you were a child bride. You look so you. I was not a child when he married her. Okay, I'm just digging really? a <laughs> hole here. I'm just digging a hole here. I said, I'm just trying to be funny. Yeah. Okay, fine. So I'm thinking, why is Gorbachev inviting me to dinner? And. Oh, he wanted to borrow 50000 He wanted to make a donation oh. to the Gorbachev. I said, you know, I don't even give money to Democratic. You know, he asked me to dinner once too, Jay. And I said, look, I, I can't. I no, can't, but he was, he was hitting on me. I can't look at that thing on your head. He was, and then it, was, then it was done. He was hitting on me. He was trying to get me to give him $50,000. All right. So you're at dinner with the CIA? Well, let me tell you, I'll tell you a funny story. So I says, is there any like, like, Jason Bourne kind of stuff that actually goes on. And she said, one time they had an agent and they had, the agent was driving with a double agent who was a Russian. 
and mm. they sensed that they were being followed. Wow. So they're trying to lose the guy. So the other guy, someone's driving and the guy is sitting here and they had an inflatable doll. So they said, when they come to the corner, open the door, jump out, and the guy will inflate the doll so it will look like he was still in the car. So <laughs> oh, they race around the wow. car. This guy jumps out, <laughs> the head pops up. So the car behind him, it looked like there was still two people in the car until they got where they're going. I thought that was great. It just made me laugh. It just made me laugh. But that's as top secret as it got. Did you know HBO Max had podcasts? Now go even deeper inside your favorite shows with audio companions to some of the most groundbreaking and award-winning shows on television. Listen to the official companion podcast for the HBO original limited series, We Own This City. Host D. Watkins dives into his experiences in Baltimore and in the writer's room and speaks to the people who brought this story to the screen. Like the show, the podcast focuses on the rampant corruption and abuse within Baltimore's criminal justice system. Watkins is joined by a variety of guests, including executive producers George Pelicanos and David Simon of The Wire, actors John Bernthal and Wunmi Musaku, as well as notable figures whose stories inspired the series. You can listen to the We Own This City podcast on HBO Max and on all major podcast platforms. You know, we have a whole part of the military subshow called DARPA. Right. You're familiar with DARPA? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, they're the dudes. Their their budget is secret, right? right. But it's billions. There and is billions. no budget. There is no budget, right? It's like the Virgin Mary. It's perfect always. The defense budget. Um, DARPA like develops like the shit we don't even know about. Like right. the next wave of. I mean, the other side plainly has stuff that has caused our diplomats to have headaches. Right, like in Havana, yeah, yeah. Yes, in Havana, that, that some other capitals where they, it must be some sort of sound wave. A microwave, yeah. Or microwave that they're, I mean, that's the kind of shit DARPA works on. Right, right. And, you know, obviously, I'd rather have us to have it than them. Right, exactly. Whoever I, them I, is. I, in the same way. Yeah. You ask why I knew, I, I had done a, when you work for the CIA and you get killed, you get nothing. Star on the wall. Nobody knows who you are. That's Anonymous right. star. So we did a benefit for the families of you, those people. You did? Yeah. yeah. Jay. <laughs> Jay, you're, well, all, you're so you. Of course you did a benefit for that. Well, I mean, of course why, you why did. Is, no, it's not bad. It's, it's good, not bad. No, no it's I'm a good saying thing. it's, it's a good just thing. you. It's yeah. like you're always you. You're yeah. Super Leno. You're just yeah. Iron Jay. Yeah. yeah. But I must say, back yeah. to the story about the people who were character assassinating you at NBC, if they really were good at it, would they concoct a story about you having a hairdresser? Well, no, that <laughs> I was, mean, that, of was all a, the that was a Dino De Laurentiis story, but yeah, yeah, me with a hairdresser, yeah, that's really. I'm believable. just saying there are certain things that are out of the realm of, you know, believability. But the idea when you when you run your own show, you you hear the information firsthand because we have an agent. We hate Lana. He sucks. They said they weren't happy with this one thing. You said no, no, no. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You don't, you don't, you don't get the. Un the perfect okay. example. I'm on stage one day, and I see a woman like this with some small. You a know, woman like what? You know, want me to sign something? Okay. You know, I'm talking, and, and I said, "Can I?" I said, "I said I'm working." I, I said, "What? Right. Meet me right there by that door when the show's over." And I'll sign it for you. You know, I just right. I got some laughs. Okay. Right. So I got back. The show ends, and I see her walk to the thing. And I, as I get over there, here the security go, Mr. Lano left instructions. He's not signing anything. <laughs> and I go, what, what, what are you, what, what are you saying? Right. You know, I see she's like, oh, like I lied to her. I go, no way, no way. That's what I have an agent. Yes. Like you have people saying things for you. Right. And I see it all the time. I would, yes. I would guess to come to the Tonight Show. And they would have some road manager that was just treating people horribly. Right. And the star was actually very nice. I agree. Whether they know or not, I don't know. So right. to me, if I go by myself, if they have a bad opinion of me, at least it was formed by meeting me. I right. And they wouldn't if they met you because again, you're Iron J. Right. But okay. uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> it's true. I and I have seen that many times myself. And have had to like say to people, yeah, uh, because people who like are, like have the word security in giant letters written right. on their back, right? 
they just have it. It's just going to give you an attitude. Like they've done actual psychological experiments like this. If you put people in certain costumes or things, they act a certain way. Right. right. If you, that that one, that famous one with prisoners and guards. Right. If right. you are the prisoner and you're wearing the prison uniform, and then the guards start immediately start acting sadistically, and it's like. Okay, you're not really a guard, but right. they just do it. Yeah, yeah. And security, so they're going to act like big assholes, and we're going to tell you what to do. And I did that once to Prince. Prince was a guest in the Prince. Tonight. Yeah, Prince was a guest in the Tonight Show. So I we put on a bald wig and a mustache, and I waited at the guard gate, and Prince comes up, you know, and he goes, uh, "Prince, Tonight Show." I said, "Prince what?" Prince. <laughs> <laughs> You're the prince of what? What prince of what? He goes, he's like, I'm a musician. I'm on the show. I'll, I'll tell him, hang on. Prince what? You know, and now he's getting pissed. No, I'm, I'm, you know, and then I, I'm starting to laugh so hard. And he goes, what, what, what's going on? And then he saw it with me. You oh, start yelling. He, you know, he was really a funny guy. He was a nice guy. He really? Had a, Prince he, was a funny guy? Yes, he had a great sense of humor. Yeah, I've read that too. You know, and, and the nicest guy, he stayed after oh. the show. He told the audience to stay. He played an hour. You know what? At, yeah. I'm remembering this now. Yeah. When Politically Incorrect was newly on and looking for, you know, some sort of confirmation that right. existed. Prince talked about it on your show. Yeah. Do you remember that? I No, I don't remember he talking about, about it. talked about watching yeah. Politically Incorrect. Yeah. Oh, that's great. And sometime later, a f of someone who worked for him at one point and knew him pretty well said that on the road, this is after he became very devout as a, what was he, a... Was seventh, Jehovah Witness? Jehovah Witness, right. maybe something like Seventh Day Adventist, right, one right. of those, and that he would, uh, you know, invite four ladies back to the room, and they thought there was going to be some great Prince orgy, and he played politically incorrect with them, he just <laughs> talked to them about Jesus, and you know, he had some bizarre. No, he was a very nice guy. He's yeah, a very nice guy. But he talked. He said, he, he, "I'm surprised that when the limo pulled up, he himself said, yeah. it's." Because Why didn't the driver? Because I looked at him. I, I said, you are... Because he was a man of few words. Well, no, no. When you talked to him, he was okay. Really? I mean, he was okay. No no attitude. Very nice to everybody. Not... No, no. I'm not saying attitude. I just... No, really, but you know what I mean? Not... always heard about him was that he was a man of few words. He oh. spoke through his music and didn't... But I guess if you felt comfortable with someone, yeah, and, you know, you're, you're kind of a... I never won anything. I, didn't, I wasn't trying to get tickets or anything. He just, right. Yeah, yeah, so. Well, I'm sure he knew that. You're, yeah. you're not like a person who really loves no. pop music or... No, I mean, no, you know, I'm you, just nice enough music. Fine. No, I, I mean, you know, you had music on... Every time I did The Tonight Show... All million times, it was like, yeah, we were kind enough to have me out first, usually, and then there was right. uh, somebody in a very short dress, right, right, and and then it was, you know, Lady Antebellum, right, right, right. and we right. would walk over to the side of the stage. We broke a lot of bands on the show. You did, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it was always like when you're right there, sent, standing that close to the band, no matter who it was, I was into it, you know. Well, of because white people want well, to be in the front row. My, I'm not a big jazz guy, but when I used to open for Miles Davis. I really enjoyed it because I watched it being manufactured. Whoa! You opened for Miles. Miles Davis had an opening act. Who was it? I was. My, I'll tell you. I'm, it was. It, 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 Lenny's on the Turnpike in Boston. It was Miles Davis, comedian Jay Leno. I, I didn't get billing. My name was just there. But it was Miles Davis, steak dinner, two drinks. <laughs> <laughs> and the show, twelve ninety five. Where were you in the order of the billing? No, I was. I was vis a vis first. the stakes. No, I was. I was first. I was first. And sometimes I'd go on, and, and Miles wouldn't show up for ninety minutes. One day, right. somebody took his yellow jacket, and it, it disappeared. And yeah, took his yellow jacket. He he always used to wear yellow. Right, I remember seeing yellow that. jacket, and somebody took it, and oh, we had no. to, had to find it. Yeah. Well, what was Herbie that? Hancock was the was in the band too? Yeah. What was that crowd like? Well, you know, back then, this predates concerts. Someone like Miles, he would come into Sandy's in Beverly, Massachusetts, any one of these jazz clubs, and you would do five nights for the money you'd make it one night playing Symphony Hall or something. But for you as a comic, what was the crowd like? The crowd was great. 
because the crowd was super just, hip because it was a jazz audience. So they right. they're like they're there to listen. If they didn't right. like it, they let you know. And but, they were smart. They were smart audiences, yeah. Right. Yeah, I remember the first actor, the first jazz guy, we call him jazz, was Buddy Rich. And they go, Len Jesus, welcome. This is my first time on stage ever. Please welcome comedian Jay Leno. And you hear a guy go, we hate him. I go, I've never, did they see me come in? Do they know my parents? How, how, why would they hate me? I'm trying to rationalize it. Nothing to go it. on. Yeah, nothing. I've never been, at, I've never been anywhere. It's my first time. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so at least you get used to that after a while. That was Kimmel. Huh? <laughs> no, that was Kimmel. You know, Kimmel's great. <laughs> I'm just fucking with you. I, I'm, you know, I'm a fan. Oh, he has this okay. thing that somehow... We don't have to even... No, it's fine. I, it's I, fine. I, you know, I, I'll tell you something. I, I want you guys he, to be friends because I... I think I, we are. Such great love for both of them. I think he did as good a job hosting the Academy Awards as anybody. Right. Real right. jokes, yes. really funny right. jokes, really ad-lib jokes. You know, it's just one of those awkward situations where he you know, he was a huge Letterman guy. Yes. And when Still Letterman is. didn't get to Tonight Show, somehow it was my fault. And right. I think he resented that. And I get that. But, you know, Dave never had the Tonight Show. I, what? No. No. Maybe I'm remembering these wars <laughs> wrong. Here's the situation. I conflate this with the first Iraq war sometimes. No, no, no. It's just, it's, it's, <laughs> this is different. This goes back. No, you, now you got to go back to what's the one in Argentina, you know. Falklands. Falklands, yeah. yeah. What it was was. That was a nasty one. Dave was a huge hit at 1230, huge. Johnny was a huge hit at 1130. Right. When I started subbing for Johnny, I was lucky enough to be able to maintain Johnny's ratings. So with me there, they had a hit 11.30 and a hit at 12.30. And NBC did not want to sacrifice one hit. If, if they moved Letterman down, I would go to CB. I would just go somewhere else. Right. And then they would have a wide open spot. Right. Plus, the, plus there were a lot of executives that did not like Dave because for whatever reason. But you had a situation there where... Um, they had a hit at 11.30 and a hit at 12.30. To move Letterman down wouldn't have gained them anything. I mean, I guest hosted for five years. I remember, I remember asking Zucker, I go, doesn't Letterman have this job? He said, no. Letterman's a hit at 12.30. We want to keep that a hit at 12.30. Zucker was when? What, when? Zucker was at, at, at NBC. Jeff Zucker. He was I know. Running, he was NBC. where at this time? He was at NBC. He was at NBC. He yeah. did the Today Show at NBC. Yeah, he did the Today that Show That was his NBC big, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. But Warren and all those people said, you know. Warren, that's, L Warren Little. Yeah, that's a hit at 12.30, and we want to keep it a hit at 12.30. Right. So they had no intention of moving Dave down. Right. <laughs> You know, I never asked you this, but Good. when when you did leave the Tonight Show, there must have been offers to do opposite the Tonight Show show from Fox or something. There were, there were a lot. You know, why didn't you do it? Th that's you know, it's interesting because um, I remember I heard Kimmel talk to you about that. That I that I had called him and I did, and I didn't realize I was supposed to do a follow up call with him. And I certainly apologize for that, but. Um, I didn't do it because here's what happened. They, they decided to, I was still on the air. I, they, they demanded that I say I'm going to leave in five years, even though I was going to be there another five years because Conan people wanted that. I said, all right, fine, fine. And I'll leave in five years. Okay. Within that five years, um, Craig Ferguson comes along. And Craig Ferguson is a huge hit. He won a Peabody. I think he won some Emmys. And now he was beating Conan. And then Zucker called me one day and said, I think we made a mistake. I go, guys, I'm out of here next year or whenever it was. And he said, well, suppose we gave you a show at 10 o'clock. I said, 10 o'clock talk shows don't work. It didn't work for Cavett in 68. It, it doesn't work. He said, I'll tell you what. I will pay your entire staff for two years regardless of what happens. So all my people get paid for two years, even if we get canceled? He goes, yeah. I said, all right, okay, I'll do a 10 o'clock show. Now, I remember Kimmel thought that, see, people forget all those 10 o'clock dramas were hugely expensive to do, hugely expensive, and they weren't getting the ratings they used to. Like ER. 
like ER. Well, ER was a hit, but Law and Order and all the others, and they were just taking a hit at 10 o'clock. The senator's wife. Senator's wife? I'm it? saying that must have been a show. Well, something like that, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, those all were huge. Tia Leone was the senator's wife. Oh, no, she was, Tia Leone was. Something, um, doesn't matter. Uh, well, she paid I the know, but president. people, but people in America are very pretentious about their 10 o'clock shows. Right. They feel like they're very, Well, very... Jeff's thing was, if you put a talk show in there, it'll get essentially the same ratings at a tenth of them. Production, cost. right? Okay. I remember I did I did that show many times. Yeah, a okay. few times. Yeah, okay. So uh, that didn't work. And then uh, you know I was oh no no deliberately sabotage his show to try and get the Tonight Show. No, <laughs> that, that doesn't work. It doesn't work that way. You try and do the best you can, and and we, it didn't work. And then they said. How about coming on at 11.30? I said, look, I don't want to go through this again. Kona, he goes, if Kona moves back to 12, would you do a half hour at 11.30? I said, talk to Conan. If you'll go to 12, I'll do a half hour. Just do a monologue of one guest. Okay. And of course, Conan didn't want to do that. And that's when he wrote the letter. And, everything. and then they put me back in and we became number one again. But why did, after you left, why didn't you go to Fox or some other place? I'm pretty loyal. I don't... What? Loyal to these assholes who fired you? You know, what? sometimes the czar you have is better than the one you're going to get. You know You what? know? And, and here, here's the thing. Uh, then you have your old team shooting at you as well. I just figured, let's, let's, just, let's just play this out and see what happens. This all happened fairly quickly. You know, I, I, I called Jimmy Kimmel and I said, I'm getting off from ABC. I don't want to start a whole thing here. If, if they're talking to put me on 11.30, would you want to go on at 12.30? I think he said, yeah, he'd like to. I said, oh, okay. We became friends. And then that didn't happen, and it became public. And I suppose I should have called Jimmy and explained to him again, but I didn't. Uh, I don't know why I didn't. I just didn't. I thought he, he probably figured it out. But I think maybe he was hurt by that, and I apologized to him for that. But... Jay, I feel like you're a victim of the um, terrible last viable prejudice in America, ageism. You have this idea in your head that, you know, you have to go out to pasture at some point. As I talk to you now, yeah. you know, you're exactly the same guy mm -hmm. who was there then. So, like, I don't think your brain is diminished. You yeah. know, you're doing all these other shows. You're still doing stand-up. You know, your hair was white then. Now it's white now. Right. You know, it's like, it's not like... This is a job That's where exactly. you have to, you know. I am a I, huge believer in low self-esteem. <laughs> what? I think it is the key to success. Because when you don't think you're the smartest that, person in the room, you shut up and you listen. When I got The Tonight Show, I hired the best producer I could, the best director, the people I thought were the best writers. I gave them contracts on a yearly basis, not 13 weeks. I said, do the best you can. And we had the same crew for, for 22 years. And when they would tell me the show sucked, I would go, why did it suck? And they'd tell me why it sucked. Who said it sucked? Well, you know, somebody, you know, you, people, you have, hey, tonight's show sucked. It wasn't good. Like, who said, are like, you talking about the Anybody on the show. And, the no. gaffer would say that to you? Yes. My, my theory was anybody can pull the cord and stop the train. You know, I remember one time we had a guy in the basement who I didn't know. I had done at the time a transgender joke. And I heard this guy was really hurt about it. And I said, I still go down to see him, you know. And he explained the situation. I said, you know something, I apologize. I said, I said you'll never hear another transgender joke from me again. And, and he was so taken by the fact that he could bring this show to a screeching halt because of his one complaint. He, he turned out to be the greatest lighting guy or, you know, sound guy, whatever he did. That we had. Oh, I thought you were going to say he sewed his dick back on. No, no, no. No. <laughs> no, but I mean, to me, that's what worked. That's that's what worked for me. The fact that, you know, the Thank fact that you, you. here's the thing. You're only as good as your last joke. When I go on The Tonight Show now with Fallon, I go on as a stand-up. I don't go on as, you know, on my day, here's the way we did the show. <laughs> you know, I go on as a guy who's a comedian who some of the audience may or may you not amazing may humility. or may not know that I hosted the show. Jay, we are not competitive. 
on who is a better human being so not because you it. always win and that's fine because like i it's like i can't even i can't even get into this arena with you it's like boxing with mike tyson uh we if we're competitive but like who's funnier i'll fucking go toe to toe with you there no but I, you I are you, fucking funny i, I i've you. always said this to people when they ask me but i said like as funny as leno is on television you have no idea i remember you and i had a talk once it's a long time ago and I was proven right. And I said, Bill, by the nature of what you do and who you are, it's going to take you a little bit longer. But you're going to be there way longer than everybody else. Jay, I was 56. Yeah, and you're, but, <laughs> but what I'm saying is you've been on the air now for 23 years, something like that, doing basically the same show. Not many 30. People- Oh, 30, okay. Well, not, politically what, incorrect. What, what, yeah, but what I'm saying was, I remember the early days you would complain about not getting guests because they were afraid to come on or whatever. Yeah, we I, still have that problem. Yeah, but you know something? You don't what? need, you don't need, it's nice no. to have, right. but you don't need it. No, absolutely. And you don't need it. Well, the reason I started this podcast is because it's like, yes, I give up and I should have given up a long time ago on the idea that oh, everybody should be able to talk about politics. Well, they don't and they can't, and that's fine. Right. And here, anybody anybody can be doing this. Right, right. <laughs> Even you, Jay. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. It's lovely. Yeah. But what I'm saying is, I'm just so proud of you, of what you've accomplished. No, no, no. and the way you've able to do it, how you've, how you've, because I remember when you would come on, you always have like one blowjob joke. Oh, we'd have to edit it out. <laughs> and I go, I wish, Bob, Bob, I, I wish Bill wouldn't do the blowjob joke in the middle of a Tonight Show set. We have to edit around it, you know? Really? But you always felt you had to put it in there. But I like the fact that- I don't remember that, that at all. I, I find the fact that now I watch you and you stand on your own and your points are yours. I, I know you're never lying because you tell right. the truth on the show. And it's what you honestly, it's the only news show that I watch where I honestly believe the host believes what they're saying. Okay. I don't have to agree, right. but I admire the fact that I can see that. And I see the well, you should agree, guests Jay. coming on talking freer than they do on any other show. Right. And that's really what makes I've never missed one of your shows. Oh, well, I, well, I do. I watch them all. I watch them oh. all. Well, I'm all overclimped. Um, yeah. So <laughs> how many days are you on the road now, the, this era of your life? Um, how many nights? Maybe 150, something that, like that. <laughs> I used to I do 210, but I, I don't anymore. You are such a preposterous human being, Jay. Now, But see, I do the road. I don't do comedy specials. I don't believe I, I I remember that. Do you remember when you smoked a pipe? Yes, that was a long time ago. Okay. Yeah. But I remember uh, you, you were always a little older and definitely more... Uh, high up in the show business tree than us youngsters at Catch a Rising Star and the improv and the comedy, not the comedy star, that was out here. We were in New York, uh, the comic strip. And uh, so like, I remember there was a pilgrimage once to see you because you were opening for someone at the Westbury Music Fair, which was a level above where we were. Right, right. And there was, oh, we're going to go see Leno and see how, he, see how he handles that crowd. And we also went to see you at Danger Fields, which was, right. a, again, a gig above ours because right. it was a headliner who would come to see you at a nightclub, a real old-fashioned nightclub, Danger Fields, on 61st in New York for two weeks, You, I think you were there. Right, right. right? right. And we all came and sat by the knee of the great master and, yes, yes. <laughs> and and you were smoking a pipe that's right and I'll, giving and doling out your wisdom I'll, on <laughs> i'll tell you a great rodney story you know i i love rodney but i knew rodney 40 years i had no idea who he voted for i had no mm. idea what his politics were. it was just about the right time. so i in 2004 i had i had uh, rodney on the show and to me i used to love it when johnny would was with Rodney because Rodney goes, it's been tough. Right. Has it been tough, John? Oh, I tell you, it's been tough. <laughs> he do six minutes, yeah. Yeah. and Johnny didn't have to say a word. But Johnny would just say, "Rough is it?" Oh, I tell yeah. you, bad week. Oh, bad week. You know, he would repeat everything, and I thought, "Oh, I wouldn't give anything to do that." So when Rodney would come on with me, we would do that. So I had him on in two thousand four, and Rodney was in his eighties. Okay, and he's doing he's doing stand up. I admired him for that. Did stand up. 
and he's sweating. And the hand gestures, you know how he does the, oh, I tell you. Well, the hand was a little off and, oh. you know, everything, not enough that I think a, a layman would notice, but as a fellow comic and someone who studied Rodney. Right. So I, I said to Debbie, I said, I think Rodney's having a stroke. Call the paramedics, you know. Oh. She goes, really? I said, yeah, there. Oh. So Ronnie, then he sat down. Hey, Jay, how are you? Things are okay now. But last week, I tell you, you know, he's doing. And he did fine, and he was fine. So the show ends. He went to the dressing room. So by this time, the paramedics show up. And I knock on the door. I said, Rodney, um, paramedics here. Can they look at you? Well, what's going on? I said, Rodney, I, you look like you're having a stroke. I'm fine. Well, I took him on the stretcher. He did have a stroke. Oh. He did have a stroke, but oh. he managed to get through it. Okay. So a couple of weeks go by. So he did the show with a stroke. Well, he looked like he was having a He stroke. got laughs with a stroke. Yeah. It's like Lou Gehrig hitting, uh, he got 28 hits, yeah. I think, bef while he had ALS. Yeah, okay. That's a good hitter. Yeah. Well, th this is what it was, Rodney. So they take him out. A couple of weeks later, Joan calls me, his wife. She goes, Jay, Rodney's in a coma. That's all right. You got to come to the hospital. So I get to the hospital. Rodney's lying there. Eyes are open. <laughs> and Joan says to me, uh, the doctor said, Rodney can hear us, but he can't respond. So I'm looking at him. I'm telling him how much I love him, what he meant to all us comics, wow. and how great he was, and working at his club was such an honor. Him. So then Joan says to me, Jay, put your finger in Rodney's hand. Oh. She goes, Rodney, if you know it's Jay, <laughs> squeeze his finger. So I feel just a slight squeeze, and I went, Rodney, that's not my finger. Yeah. <laughs> so Rodney goes like this. He moved He moved he, I mean, he, his shoulder jumped. And oh. Joan did, oh my God, he moved out. And then we called the doctor and he didn't last much longer after that. But just to get a laugh out of Rodney like that was great. It well, was my favorite thing. If there was anything that we needed to complete the Jay Leno resume, What's it's that? you making a dead man laugh. Well, no, okay, Jay, well, you but, win. But, you win. But no, For fuck's sake, uh, you win. It was great. And you made a dead man laugh. But it was Now, here's what I can offer, and okay. it's not nearly on the same okay, level, go but ahead. it's so interesting. It connects you and Rodney. Yeah. That is this. When I started, and for a number of years after I started, the hardest part was the opening because they don't know you. Right, right. So how do you like break the ice? Like the place we are now is such a luxury. Our opening line is thank you, thank you, please sit down, stop clapping for me because right. I want to do my show. Right. And this is thank you so much, but okay. But at the beginning, you had to like find a way to do that. And I was just bad at it. And I tried a million things and it just was not my metier. Rodney and you both had things I was so jealous of because Rodney's was, <laughs> hey, how you doing? I'm all right now. I'll tell you last week I was in rough shape. Right, right, right. Like, what can't you go from there? Right, right, exactly. So in two seconds, he was right. in. He last week I was in rough shape. Uh, Today's all right, but oh, last week I tell you. Last week my wife told me she was only going to have sex once a week. That's all right. Some guys she cut out all together. Yeah, right. <laughs> my favorite Rodney joke was about uh, I see this club, topless bottomless. I go in, there's nobody there. That was my. <laughs> I mean, it's it's oh. such a perfect joke. Oh, he had economy of words, topless, bottomless. There was nobody there. When I was my very first year in comedy, he called me in my little shitbox apartment on 8th Avenue because someone tried to sell him a joke, my first joke, really, my take a lawyer into confession joke. Oh, yeah, you know my Dr. Cohen. Mr. Yeah, Cohen. My, my, yeah. So, and he had the grace, and I, what a great guy, because I was nothing. He could have just bought yeah. that joke. Right, and said, right. I don't care if you stole it. Whoever was trying to sell it to him heard me say it and was trying to sell it, right, steal it. Right, right, right. And I'll always remember that, that yeah. he called me. He did not have to do that. No, he's a real comic. Okay. Did you ever meet Joe Ansis? Joe Ansis was his manager? No, Joe Ansis was his muse. Muse? Yeah, Joe his Ansis was, was guy. the guy who I oh, think yeah. made Rodney. I don't know if you ever saw Rodney before he, he got the no respect thing. Rodney used to do bits. Really? Yeah, I remember seeing Rodney do, and it was a funny bit. He, he used to do those old fashioned kind of pieces. He'd go, hey, here's a airline pilot, uh, da da da. There you go. Hey, we're flying over uh, so and so. <laughs> Welcome to flight so and so. We find 148 passengers on board. On the left side of the plane, if you look out, you can see the wreckage of flight 907 that crashed, <laughs> crashed two years ago. And then he goes, 
you were with me on that flight, weren't you, Bob? You know, and it, it, and it was a huge laugh. And and it was like, but it was it was a it was like a bit like a Smothers Brothers kind. Of, Rodney? It, yeah, yes, yes, I yeah. Never, Rodney, Rodney never, used to do material. I never. And, knew and Joe Ansis was a guy. Oh, he gave him a. Think character. of the funniest guy you know who's afraid to get on stage. Right. He, he was that kind of a guy, and Rodney would uh, sit with Joe after shows, and I think they'd kibitz and go back and right. forth. And and if you read the book, uh, Len, uh, Len, it's a Goldman, Albert Goldman, ladies and gentlemen, Lenny Bruce. If you read that book, there's a whole oh, lot of stuff in there about I'm Joe Anthony. Big Albert Goldman fan. Not, no, really. Uh, okay. Well, his Elvis book. Yeah. Did you ever read the Lenny book? Not the Lenny one. I read the John Lennon one and the and the Elvis one. Well, you should read the the Lenny, I will. Lenny Bruce book. Albert Goldman took a lot of shit. Yeah. And maybe he is a shit, but I tell you, oh, what's that? I thought I'd, let me just oh thought I turned my geez. phone off. You got a Jay? Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the last person I ever thought would have a phone. I didn't even think you had a cell phone. Oh yes, yes. I've but you don't text age. really, do you? Not really, no. I, I mean... <laughs> I don't like having a permanent record of everything I say. Re no. Just like, how, oh, for fuck's sake. What, why? why when would you're, I your that? friends at the CIA are going to no, no, fucking get a yeah. Jason Bourne to like, assassinate no. you because of something? What are you talking about? You Texting is for just business. Like You're right. You don't want to write a love letter on right, text, right. but that's not what it's for. Whenever somebody tries to start a, a serious, long conversation on text, I'm like... No, that's for some other method of communication. I did a joke you would like. I said, uh, someone, President Biden. Someone in the club, someone uh, asked me, he said, Aren't you afraid of being attacked on stage like uh, Dave Chappelle, oh, yeah, I get Chris, that now, Chris yeah. Rock? Yeah. And I go, No. Yeah. Because my, my audience is my age. By the time they're getting out of that ship, I'm halfway to Cleveland. Okay. <laughs> Again, ageist, Jay. You're okay. too into that ageist. See, I remember the old days you... when the only performers you could punch on stage were mimes. Remember? You go, hey, <laughs> guy trying to get out of the box. Hey, come here, smarten up. But, you know. Jay, I'm going to finish my story about Rodney. Go ahead. Finish your and up. why I was jealous of you and Rodney yeah. for the same thing, which was getting into what you're doing quickly. Yeah. Rodney had that. You used to come out and go, see the paper? See the paper? Yeah, see the paper today? Oh, I can't And it. it was like, oh, fuck, that's so great. One one of yours was, see the paper? Muhammad Ali's coming out. <laughs> coming out of rich. I think he's fighting Buddy Epson. Yeah. I think he was fighting Buddy Epson at the time, who was, exactly. of course, Barnaby like Jones. Like a 90-year-old. <laughs> Barnaby Jones. You know Barnaby was going to fight when someone called him Pops. Hey, Pops! Well, I, I ought to, yeah, yeah, stupid. Yes, Muhammad Ali's going to yeah, fight yeah. Buddy Epson. And you were, like, into it. Yeah, you just start going. You and know. I was like, you know, that used to fuck, drive. I need something like that. That used to drive Seinfeld crazy. Why? What do you mean? Because he'd watch me, and I'd have a complete non sequitur. It meant nothing. I'd go, da-da-da-da. It's the same with insurance. And he would go, wait, wait a minute. What's the same with insurance? What, you know, after, you, after the third time you see, you go, wait a minute, that has nothing to do with insurance. What, what are you talking? About? And I'm going, it's the same with insurance. And like, wait a minute, you well, know, you still do that? No, no, but it's, uh, I'm sure I do it in some other form. But yeah, but like when you do your act now, mm -hmm. you're, like I talked to you recently on the phone. You were from, you were at some Indian casino in upstate New York. Yeah, I was just saying a couple of times ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it was the Gabino tribe, but yeah. Gabino. Uh, it was uh, <laughs> Chief Compadrinka. Yeah, Chief Compadrinka, yeah. <laughs> okay, so like you do 90 minutes? 60? Yeah, about 90. Okay. And of course, you do it not like me with a poor man's teleprompter. You know, I have a music stand on stage. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I've had that for over 20 years. Oh, okay. You think I could remember? I don't know, but it 90 works. 90 minutes? It works. Yes, it works. I mean, of course, when I do a stand-up special, um, like I just did adulting, Right. Uh, it's uh, on a teleprompter. But, you know, when I was just in Montreal, I was just in Mount Pleasant, right. Michigan, I t there's a music stand, and I can't remember 90 minutes. How can you remember 90 minutes? In the right order, Jay. Well, I clear my head of everything else. Oh, well, if you're going to go there. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, fuck, fuck that. I'm trying to work on a thing now I thought was going to Clear your head. I'm watching this. Tell me if this is funny. I'm watching, I see this commercial with Doug Flutie and Frank Thomas, some kind of male enhancement thing, right? 
and they're playing golf and the male enhancement. And then, and then at the end he goes, and women like it too, wink, wink. I go, yeah, yeah, try that tomorrow at the office, okay? By the second wink, HR will have you on the floor and all your stuff in the box. Come on, pops, come on, let's go. And women like it too, wink, wink. Yeah, that's Wait. gonna go over real big. So yeah. are you saying this is a bit you're gonna- I, 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 Is it, it funny? Is that very funny? Yeah, okay. But you know, Jay, you're a funny guy. So, but like when you do your 90 minutes, yeah. it's more like stuff like that. Cause that's the old Leno right. that I remember that was like blew everybody away. That's really the Leno that you brought to when you started doing Letterman as, right. a, as exactly. a guest on Letterman. I mean, exactly. you would just blow the roof off the place because you were doing like chunks of your act that were really funny. And like, they were, you know, but they weren't like political. You got more political no. when you hosted the Tonight right, Show. But right. you know, you had that, whole hunk about the uh, <laughs> just sucking the sugar sacks dry in 7-Eleven. Remember the people oh, who were in 7-Eleven? Oh, yeah, vaguely. Yeah, I can't remember that. Yeah, yeah. And whole shit. Packs it. <laughs> you know, like, whole bags of sugar sucked dry. You know, the fun the part was, I remember what I would do Letterman was to come up with words that were not swear words, but were hopefully funnier. So in the sense that, we, oh, remember I had the bit, I can't remember what the bits was about, uh, those carnivals, traveling carnivals, and the, you know, the syphilitic druids running the rides, <laughs> no, the, shirt, no, no. the shirtless man, nice looking boy, lady, you know, that kind of deal. Yeah. No, that's not where you said druid. You had a great bit about Bo Derek. And what was that? Bo, Bo Derek yeah. and John Derek were two gorgeous people. Right, right. And they got married. Right, right. And you were like, okay, I could see the attraction, but like after they have sex, what is that conversation like? So the uh, druids were a working people. <laughs> Do you remember that? Oh, vaguely. Yeah. Yeah, was, vaguely. <laughs> that always killed me. So the druids were a working. That's what they imagined you said. I mean, they said after sex. But uh, no, you had a great. And so that's what your act is now. More like yeah, that. Yeah, you know, I took, I took politics out. Oh, you did? Because. Like you wouldn't comment on that, what's going on with the Trump. No, because here's, here's where you want to know. alienate half the crowd? I, I do a couple of references, and I notice the audience hears the name. You, you know, Biden did this. Right. And then they wait, is right. it going to be pro or con? Right. And they decide, and go, you know, some, can we just rise and fall on the joke? Right. You know, I, I, I like to think there's some people who go to a comedy show, they just want to see comedy, that's all. They don't want to get a lecture. They don't want to be yelled at or whatever it might no. be. So you just, that's what I love about Rodney. I, no idea where Rodney stood politically. I right. couldn't care less. It was just about the joke. And, but, that, and that's what I'm trying to do now. But let's not say, Jay, that there's no place in the world for someone who you do know exactly where they stand politically. No, I think it's great. No, okay. no. Because <laughs> then I don't have an but, act but at all. My, you know? my, my situation is different. I, d I do the other America a lot. No, I know. And, you know, like on this game show, You Bet Your Life, we sold it on the premise that there's no politics. Right. And people bought it on well, the premise. Because I see people come on, I see a contestant, I go, okay, I can tell right away, this is a guy I would not agree with politically. And that's fine, yeah, Jay. That's right. One of the major themes I've expressed over the last four or five years on the show, it's also in my stand-up act, right. is that the biggest problem is that there is so much hate, right. people can't even know what the other side is saying. Exactly. So the, the main way to reduce that hate, or at least the first step, is everyone has to stop talking politics right. all the time. We right. didn't used to do this. Right. We The neighbor back when we were kids could have been what we would now call a Trumper, Right. but we didn't go there. Right. And therefore we got along and the people who think that somehow the half of the country they despise will self-deport are delusional. Right. There's not gonna be a civil war, or if there is, there's no way to split the country by states. We're all marbled in together. Right. There's four million Trump voters in California. Right. Okay. You know, I mean, we can't do that. We have to stop being political about everything. Right. So anything that like, and again, not me, I'm the exception here, but Everybody else, <laughs> no, I, or lots of other people, be apolitical. You're right. Do it, do it that way because you have to be able to get along with those people. I always say you can hate Trump. You can't hate all the people who like right, him. Right, exactly. It's half the country. And you know, I remember- And you always had your finger on the pulse of that beat. That's why your show was so successful. 
you, that's why I do personals, because if you can't stand in front of people and do the joke, then it's not effective. It's, you're a coward. You should be able to do the material to the people's faces. And, and if they don't like it, they'll let you know. And people understand when you're being fair and unfair and what's a joke and what's not a joke, you know? I mean, is this a Trump joke? Um, I saw this uh, political science professor on the news and he analyzed all of Donald Trump's speeches. And he said that Donald Trump talked at a fifth grade level or below. <laughs> And when they told Trump this, he called the professor a duty head. <laughs> okay. Is that a political joke? Of course. Uh, yeah, but of course. Because but if you follow it with a Biden joke, then oh, then it's okay, you know. Well, I mean, that's a political joke for this exact reason because every single person he who hears it will like it or not like it based on how they feel about Donald Trump. Right. Exactly. His fans will hate it. Right. And his detractors will adore it, and everyone will realize it's not really that great a joke. Right, no. right, right. <laughs> but, okay. no, but, but when you follow it with a Biden joke, oh, oh, okay, then again. Right. I mean, I find that you actually have, I've had reviewers count which side, right. how many were, uh, you know, I think he's more of this because there right. were like nine jokes and there's right. only four on there. But I mean, you certainly used to do that on The Tonight Show. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but then you have to because you're doing yeah. a monologue. And we, we, we got to hate mail from both sides. Of course, and that's, and that's when you know you're doing it right. Right. That's what I, I mean, I get, for the first time in the last couple of years, I get a mixed audience. I know. Politi politically. That's now, what I like about your show now. Stand up also. Yeah, yeah. Like where 40% will be sort of conservative and I'll do a Trump joke and I can, uh, but then they'll still laugh. Right. They're, they're not crazy, all of them. They no. know he's a preposterous figure. Right, exactly. And now he's really going to, looks like he could be going down. Yeah. I mean, I really was pessimistic about him coming back and winning in 2024. This January 6th hearing, I got to give it to these people and some of this stuff that's going to come out. I do think he's, I think it's taking him to a degree where yeah, I, they're, they're just going to go. Plus no. the country has other problems. They're not concerned yes, about the last election. Exactly. And they see that this guy is, yeah. as I always said, everything comes back to the narcissism. That's right. When you're a narcissist, nothing is seen through any other lens. Well, just, the the, the yeah, whole thing is, I lost the election, that can't be right, because I'm a stable genius. Yeah, just the fact that he said he wanted the metal detectors removed, because anybody with a gun is not coming after him. Right. <laughs> you know? the president, you go, right. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Well, in that crowd, kind of. In that crowd, he was kind of right about that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and... You know, he always said, we have the tough people. Yeah. Meaning the military, the police. And that's very scary when a when a civilian leader is talking about, like, I don't want to push you too far, but I want you to know we have the tough people with us. In other words, right. the people with the guns. I mean, we're so close to banana republic and military. We're close, but we're not there. You know, you got yeah, Mark but, Neely and these guys. Uh, who? A joint chief of staff, you know, military, general. Oh, Millie, yeah. Yeah, Millie. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Had dinner with him, too, actually. Come on. I did. I had dinner with him in Washington. Oh, fuck you, Jay. I did. He's a very nice guy. I know. And a very reasonable guy. Shut up. He's a Massachusetts guy. Is, so how did the... Is there just a... Is there an 800 number where, like, important people no, just but call I do you a, up? No, I, but I do a lot of veteran things, so you, oh, you get invited. I see. You get invited to have dinner and all that kind of stuff. So. Of course. Yes. Perfect Jay. Always doing the right yeah, thing. So, so the world know. leaders want to talk to yeah, him. It's hilarious, isn't it? Yeah, I'm What's... having dinner with William Shatner next week. There you Suck go. Suck on that, There you Jay. go. There you go. There you <laughs> what? I rest my case. I can. Yeah. So you, know, you have uh, dinner with Lyle Wagner. Yeah. <laughs> is he still with us? No, I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> well, why? I'm just making why, why drag I just, him? I, I thought the name would get a laugh from you, which it did. No, when you walked in and you said, welcome to Half's Place, yeah. James Franciscus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. That Look what James Franciscus gave me, you know, some 19-year-old. You know, yeah. <sighs> All right, well... I can't tell you how much fun this is. This was fun. I thanks thanks for having me on. You I got think. so loaded, Jay. Uh, yo, God, you know me. That's my life. I, you've never had a drink of no. Me. Come no. on, I'm, I, it doesn't interest me. Right, but you never were curious as to no. just. Well, I'm sure your liver thanks you. Huh? 
Yeah, I just, I, I have no moral, religious, or any, uh, nothing for it against it. It's right. Just, I was always the designated, like I, yeah. I was the car guy, I was a designated driver, so I, it's just not something that interests me. You're a car guy? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> See, there's a side you know nothing about. I was supposed to do Jay Leno's Garage. Yeah, but you know, you know nothing about cars. So what? It's a celebrity show. Right. Why, you you have another it? show on YouTube that's really about cars. Right, right. right. But Jay Leno's Garage, you don't have to be... Uh, you want to be on? We'll have you on. You booked me. I wasn't... It wasn't well, one. And what happened? I got COVID. Oh, that's what it was. Okay. Oh, yeah. That's just, right. So it wasn't our fault. So we'll you do it I understand you just had a bout of COVID. I got it. Jay, I'll tell your story if you die. I'm joking. I'm just, I'm always mocking how overreactive everyone is to fucking COVID. Well, yeah. So you were fine, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Everybody was fine. I mean, everybody seems to get it now. But, you know, the thing is less virulent. We've had vaccines. Like, people got to let it go, don't you think? Well, I think you got to be, uh, it does affect people differently. So I don't know. Okay, let's not, we won't go there. Yeah. <laughs> but, but this car, I'm, I'm, fascinated by this so you what do you drive right now i'm driving a 71 <laughs> porsche 911 which of the 250 cars is... well two or three actually. okay so like how do you decide when you have that many cars i mean well whatever you're i'm kind working of like on, the hugh hefner of cars whatever like i'm you have working a on of cars. whatever i'm working on at the time is uh usually what you know. so that's what you want to it must what does it cost you just to maintain like registration, oh. insurance. It's crazy. You must have a whole staff. To, I mean, you must oh, yeah. have a registration come up every other day. Yeah, I do. Yeah, that's true. And there's somebody who handles this? Yeah, yeah. Well, we got to cover it. We're fine. You I know you're worried about it. <laughs> no, I'm just... I'm I got just, a full shop. It's so I, interesting. I, I, do, I do paint and body work. We do metal work. We do fabrication. Really? Yeah, it's, it's a 140,000 square feet garage. I mean, if I hit somebody, I could, like, get... You, you'd fix it for me? I don't know if I'd fix it for you, but uh, <laughs> I'd help you out. Yeah, sure. Really? Sure. You'd do the work? You'd yeah. do the body work? That's on? what we do. That's what we do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I didn't know it was such a... Oh, yeah. Like a... Come by sometime. I'll show it to you. I'm on, booked on your show. Well, you're, you're not booked now. But I was. Yeah, but you got COVID, so we'll do, okay. it, next, we'll do it next season. You know what? You don't have to have me if you don't want No, me. I'd I, love to have you on. If it's really more about the car... No, I'd love to have you ...than the person... On. No, I'd love to have you on. But I, I feel like I've volunteered. I, I taught, taught Norm MacDonald how to drive on my show. I know how to drive, Jay. <laughs> I have an excellent drive. I sound like Rain Man now. I have an excellent driving record. I do. Um, and I watch <laughs> Wapner every day. At <laughs> Wapner? <laughs> well, that was in Rain Man, wasn't it? Oh. Yeah. Remember he watched, he was Judge Wapner. I used to have a joke about Wapner. Do you remember that joke? It was... That's when People's Court was the only judge show on TV. And Wapner was huge. And I said, you know, it must be tough though when he goes to where the judges hang out. You know that bar, like, <laughs> and they're sitting there going, well, I think the rights of the individual triumph, the rights of the majority in certain cases. Here comes Wapner. Hey, how's the case of the puppy stained carpet? How's that working out? <laughs> you, know. <laughs> you know. I think I do remember that. Yeah, it was a stupid joke. Oh, Jay. You always say that about your jokes. It's a stupid joke. But you wouldn't do it if it was stupid. When when there was a writer's strike, like, you wrote your own monologue. Right, right. And nobody else could have done that. There's nobody else who... Well, could, I'm glad like, the strike didn't last that long. Let's well, you're me. both... Somehow, the, you're somehow both the guy who never fired a writer, right? And that one of your... No, I never fired anybody. Right. Guys left because they get better opportunity or right. something. Right, okay. You never fired a writer, which that's preposterous. And you also can actually write your own monologue, so you could have fired them all. I no, mean, not really, because The Tonight Show is too labor and it's just too much. No, but when you, I remember when, during the strike, right. I remember like listening, to, I was like, wow, that's an actual real monologue of real, like new jokes. Well, I you think must that have was really all, you, worked your ass off. You know, the key to that, I remember one guy said to me on the street one day, hey, I don't like you. But I like uh, your jokes. I said, okay, so you don't like to manufacture, but you like the product. That's fine. That works with me. You know, I would always see comedians guest host different shows. And they never had material. 
You know, I mean, the reason Ellen was successful was she was a comedian. She oh, yeah. opened the show with real Joe. Yeah. You oh, know, yeah. it wasn't just, who, everybody cool? Who, give me some fun oh, game? Yeah. Like, you know, it wasn't that. I know, Ellen's a great oh, comedian. Great comic, yes. great comic. Yes. Thinks like a comic. Yes. Has funny jokes. Absolutely. Has an edge to and, her that's good. Yeah. And the delivery is perfect. Yeah, she's the great. The timing. Excellent. Spot, yeah. spot on Benny yeah, timing, yeah. you know, like, and, and a minimalist. Yeah. You know, yeah. without ever raising the voice. Right, right. And also, like, uh, in her stand-up, very apolitical. Right, right. You know, yeah. very like everybody can get in on this. And that, right. I keep saying, we need more of whatever can make us have a communal experience. I agree. And you can't, you're right about your show. You can't, your show, you can't have any politics because right away, everything is tribal. Yeah. And we, and we didn't used to be there in this country. No, no. I mean, a man of... You know, Jay, what are you, 10, 15 years older than me now? Yes, know? yes, I'm 88 years old. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I mean, I know you're, you're, I know you're in your sevens. Yeah, I'm 72. 72. Yeah. How old are you now? 65. 66. 66. Yeah. There you go. I know. But again... You, you know what's so funny about you that? You look the same because you have that Italian No, thing. you look the same because we look the same. I remember once the Rolling Stones were on TV in my office and some interns came in and I went... You know, I got to give Mick Jagger looks pretty good. And I look at them and they're like, <laughs> I mean, they were just laughing because he was this old, old man. And I go, does he really look that up? And they're like, Mr. Leno, the guy's 82 or 61 or whatever. Oh, this is recently? Yeah. The, I mean, this was like well, maybe seven, eight years ago. Yeah. Well, I mean, now. It, it, it just it just made me laugh. You no, know, I saw them in the. Up I'll give you another example. We're sitting, we're, it, 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 we were shooting the car show, you know. And the director said to one of the PAs, hey, Dave, what? When did you graduate high school? He said 2012. So it was 2019, 27, 2014. When did you graduate high school, Mr. Leno? 68. 68? <laughs> 68? Yeah, but Jay. As in 19, no, 1868, you know. But you know what, Jay? What every other country in the world understands is that that makes you wiser. That makes you know things that other people don't know, which is not a detriment. It's an ad. It's a plus. Right. It's good that you know that every other country, every other culture has always gotten this. This is the only stupid fucking one that looks at that and goes, well, it, po it couldn't possibly have any meaning if I wasn't alive for it. Well, I was talking to your, one of your producers and it made me laugh. I was talking to a young person, a younger person, maybe 35. And he said, to me, in the course of a comedy, he goes, well, you know, back in the 90s, people were really stupid back then. I go, really? <laughs> What was stupid about the night? What was the stupid part of the night? Like people were illiterate, they couldn't read what? What, what was the, and he couldn't tell me what it was, but it's just, people were just stupid back then. Yeah. Well, people just get more and more stupid, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, because the people who, I mean, they were stupid in the 90s, but those people who were stupid in the 90s then became the teachers sometimes <laughs> That's right. of the people. I mean, you know, like it's so, um, we're, we're at least two generations past, I think, uh, the last time, I mean, Gen X is the last generation that like wasn't a bunch of pussies. And I don't think this country can ever come back from where we are. I mean, people say, well, you know. It'll we, come back from where you are. Well, yes, I, you know what it is? I mean, I, it's like you talk a, about the great, greatest generation and then you suddenly go to our generation, you see guys like Pat Tingle there. You know, remember the football player? Who, who gave up a lucrative... Pat Tillman. I mean, Tillman, I'm not thinking. Yeah. Pat Tillman, sorry. Yes. Uh, died in Afghanistan. Died in Afghanistan. A friendly fire. He was a uh, yeah. Arizona Cardinals yeah. star, yeah. a linebacker. Yeah, I mean, here's a guy who could have had a multi-million dollar yes. career, chose to fight for this. See, you'll always have those people. And nine times out of 10, well, they'll be first generation. Okay. They'll be named Morales or, you know, or have uh, some Spanish surname or a Cuban or American or, or Italian or Latin, because those are the ones that keep the country great. They come in, they fight for the country, they have children, you know. I, when we used to knock on doors. That's and, kind of a fuck you to the Smiths and the Jones, huh? <laughs> well, well, I remember once we were doing a jaywalk. They don't fight for their country? And this guy answers the door and he speaks Spanish, older guy, it's like 70 something, okay. He gets his son, the son comes over, he speaks English and Spanish. And then he introduced me to his son, who's got like an F.U. T-shirt on, and some kind of pork pie hat, and he's got a video game, and he's just an idiot. I mean, the old man was probably still was still working, 
And his son was still working, but not as hard as the old man. And the kid was just a lazy thing. What about the Jews, Jay? Do they make your list of the good people? Yes, they do. No, thank you. The Jews are in. Thank yes, you. What about do. the Filipinos, yes, I love Jay? the Filipinos. I think they would fight for their country. Yeah. They're very, Well, very that's exactly what I mean. But I right. think the first, just first-generation people, that right. was one of the saddest things when they closed the border. And you had all these people who could have come here, and instead they'll go to someplace else that, you know, Steve Jobs was Syrian, I believe, wasn't he? Well, his, his pa one of his parents, right, I believe, right. was Syrian. Well, yes. that's what I mean. Sure. We could have gone to yeah. another country. Yeah. Yes. I mean, well, you're Italian, I'm Irish. I right, mean, yeah, yeah. I was telling Lisa Kudrow that my grandfather, who I never met, but he was my grandfather, had a full-on Irish brogue. Yeah. I mean, we're a young country. Yeah. And and it shows, by the way, because we act like a teenager still. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think in, in historical terms, we are like sort of like a little bit out of our teens but still acting like douchebaggy uh, you know I, I see the elvis movie in the theaters now it always makes me think like this country is very elvis like we're like fat drug addled <laughs> yeah like delusional gun nuts right right just like elvis right, i mean right, his yeah. story resonates because yeah. that's the story of us, us. <laughs> this is us he was 42 <laughs> when he died it seems so oh, old yes. when i was 25. Do you remember where you were? Yes, I do. I do too. Yeah, yeah. I was I was 21. I yeah. was driving back from my summer, the trip you take to see the country where you drive, and we had no money and an $800 car and were selling hash, like right. Easy Rider. Right, right. And made it all the way to California. And then, of course, that took like six weeks, and we wanted to get back home so bad, we drove home like in two days. Yeah, it's funny. And I heard it on the radio. Yeah. Driving through Pennsylvania. Elvis Presley, and he, he wasn't even my era, That's right. really, because like <clears throat> I was Beatles. Yeah, Elvis was like, right. oh, he's like this old school, right, right. And but I, when he came back, like after the movie contract in 1970, and Suspicious Minds, that kind of stuff, he was cool again to me. Yeah, I lo and I, I was. Still I remember when he died. I said, you know, so I'm going to go up to Sour Records and buy an Elvis record. By the time I got there, there wasn't one record left. Everything Elvis had been sold. It was like, wow, he only died like four hours and yet, ago. You told me a story not that long ago. What's that? That you were in Vegas and they were taking down a big. No, they were. I was at. They were. I saw these two guys carrying Elvis's one of those six foot cardboard cutouts. Right. And I said, Oh, what are you putting up a Elvis thing? The guy goes, Putting it up. <laughs> no, we're taking it down. He goes, nobody knows who Elvis is anymore. All his fans are 80, you know. Yeah, and they just passed me in the hall, you know. So. That stuck with me. Yeah, yeah. But I, I mean, obviously, since they made a movie, he must still have some resonance. Oh, I'm sure, of course he still has resonance. Of course he does. Sure he does. But you're saying like there were... No, I'm just saying it's just a change of, you know, yeah. if you don't know, you don't know, you know. But, I mean, it's a little scary to think that someone as big and iconic as Elvis could be like who, but I'm sure he is to lots of. Was anybody bigger than Al Jolson? No. No? Say the name. And Al Jolson? Is Al that... Jolson was huge. Is he the guy who did the blackface? Yeah, yeah. He mammy and swammy. Yeah, and all that kind. yeah Al Jolson, <laughs> jazz singer, he, the first talk. Okay, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> even Jay, you, you don't even remember Al Jolson. Even Bing, Bing Crosby. Yes, Frank Sinatra. Yeah, I'm, I'm guess I'm guessing the name rings a bell, but people have no idea right. that you know. Frank. I mean, a friend of mine has a kid who's 14, who knows me as the car guy. Had no right. idea. I, as far as they knew, he did the Tonight Show before Jimmy Fallon. You're right. Nah, -uh. you know. <laughs> you know he did. Nah. -uh. Well, that's the famous Paul McCartney, the the when he was in Wings. Like people didn't know he had the. I have him on my phone. I have the funniest call from Paul McCartney. Oh, he calls and he goes, and it's all right. That's all the time. No, we have it sounds like show. it sounds like a phony call. He goes, Jay, Paul, Paul McCartney calling. How are you? Because I asked him to be on my car show, and I called him. I left a message, and he called me back to say that he's really busy right now. He's on tour, but maybe next season. I said okay, but it's really funny to hear him just. Hello, Jay. 
Paul McCartney here. Well, Jay, it may interest you to know that Tommy James of Tommy James and the, and the Chandel, Chandels Crystal and Clover is over on and my over. speed dial. Yeah. So fuck you, Jay. Bobby Vinton. Thank you too. for coming I know you by. Have Bobby Vinton. Too. Sorry. In fact, that you Bobby have, Vinton. I think sorry is, that you. Have. Bobby Vinton is out in the hall right now. He's on the show. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. That Thanks was, for having me. I know. Lot. You like, know, anytime you call me, I will come. I no know. Matter what it is. And like, you're the kind of guy. Like, this is how. Just to see half. We play. get. We get to uh, have a conversation. Oh,